Welcome back to another episode of Bucket of Chum, the Shark Movie Podcast. As always, I'm your host, Captain Steve. This week, we are talking about Shark Season from 2020, directed by Jared Cohn or Jared Kahn. I don't know, fucking pick one. Uh, this movie is starring Michael Madsen from Free Willy and one of my all-time favorite movies, Reservoir Dogs, where he played Mr. Blonde. And this was written by Mark Atkins, whose name sounds familiar right now because I believe he also directed another shark movie that I did recently. I honestly can't remember which one. I'm drawing a total blank on it right now. But enough about that. Let's get right into the letterbox plot synopsis. Dozens of great white sharks attack the sleepy coastal town of Gold Coast, California, resulting in several deaths and forcing the town council to bring in a group of marine biologists and shark hunters to solve the problem. But when one shark in particular refuses to go down without a fight, it will take all of the biologists and hunters know how to defeat the creature for good. Okay, so I always write the plot descriptions out before I actually watch the movie. And now after watching this movie, this is weird. This plot description is weird. Um, it must be for a different movie, I think, maybe. No, I don't know. We'll get into it. But this also says that it's based on a true story. It says it right on the poster. My best guess is that this is based on the 1916 um, Jersey Shore shark attacks, which, of course, is alluded to in Jersey Shore shark attack. Um, there's also a movie based on that specific event more true to what actually happened called 12 Days of Terror. I highly recommend checking it out. It's actually a pretty decent movie. Not very gory or anything like that. It's more uh, story-driven, but... Um, a lot of good tension and feels more realistic. So I definitely recommend checking that out. I'll probably discuss it at some point when I don't know. So basically, uh, from the poster, there's a scared woman who I assume is our protagonist and lots of shark fins behind her. But I, I imagine they'll kill off a majority of these sharks early on and then we'll be left dealing with just one shark, as it says in the plot description. Um, I'm, I'm going to assume the CGI is less than average, but that's just a guess. But, tis the season, so let's dive in. So this is, in fact, from the Asylum, as it tells us right in the opening credits. I will say right off the bat, the opening cinematography is absolutely gorgeous. And then, right after that, we see a sexy bikini babe paddleboarding, uh, heading into the water. And I actually think I used this clip in the intro video. If you're watching this on YouTube, it's in the intro video. It's just a girl laying down on a paddleboard, paddling out. Uh, but yeah, that, I'm pretty sure that's uh, the clip that I used. We see a shark stalking her, and it's all stock footage for a little bit, until it has to interact with her. And then we get some, like, really iffy CGI. The shark pulls her under and chomps on her. So it's typical Asylum, but the cuts were a little bit less quick, so we saw a bit more carnage. Not a lot, but a little bit. Uh, don't know that it's enough to keep me excited about this movie yet, but we'll see. I mean, I at least appreciate it. It was slightly different from what they usually do. Slightly, not a lot. It, maybe it was just a mistake, actually, so who fuck knows. James, played by Michael Madsen, is in a garage looking at some old paintings um, in a box while some sad piano music plays. He calls his daughter Sarah, played by Paige McGraven, and what we learn here is her mom is dead, and dad thinks that she should start taking up painting. She doesn't want to because every time she does, it just reminds her of mom, I guess. It just, it's too hard for her, so no, whoop de fucking do I feel like this whole movie is going to be a soap opera. She tells her dad uh, her and Jason and Megan, a makeup artist, are going to take some photos out on the water or whatever. I don't know if we actually uh, hear what all of these people do. Like, I guess maybe Sarah is um, just a model. I don't know that they ever actually like say that's what her profession is. I have no idea. I'm just going to assume so. 
we see Mr. Buff Dude Jason himself uh, with Megan after this, and they're talking movies. They, they mention Soylent Green, like, ah, Soylent Green is people. <laughs> I, I don't know why they threw that in there. It's actually, actually, you know what? That's probably one of the most interesting parts of this movie. Spoiler alert. And then Sarah comes, and they all chit-chat. And then they decide to take photos at a different location, even though it's a few hours uh, longer. They go for it, uh, and they want to be the first people to take photos at this spot. So it's this new rock formation that apparently has formed um, because of hurricanes or something like that. Yeah, so it's been submerged. Now it's not, so they want to be the first people to take photos there. Great. They head out on kayaks. I thought they were using, like, an actual, like, real fucking boat, but no, they're using kayaks. So, yeah, they're pretty much screwed. We get some shots of them bantering on their kayaks, but they're so obviously not in the water because all we see is, like, their upper body, like, basically just a bust shot and them, like, kind of moving their arms a little bit like they're fucking paddling. And we're supposed to believe they're paddling anyways. It's just, it's really bad. Oh, you best believe that's a paddling. That's a Simpsons reference. <laughs> From an overhead shot, we see a shark circling the kayaks, and then the three of them start talking about Sarah's mom and how great she was and about Sarah's dad and blah, blah, blah. Again, no one cares. Just a lot of this family drama bullshit. We see the shark again, all CGI this time, and when we go to its POV, it's all murky water, but in the overhead shots, like, the water looks pretty clear. So, like, it's a little jarring to go back and forth between these shots where... It, nothing really matches, so it just it doesn't really make any sense. As the shark continues to tease us, the three of them spot a pod of dolphins, and they're all happy dappy, taking pictures. And as Sarah looks at one photo, she says one dolphin looks really beat up, and it looks like it has bite marks on it. Welcome to the ocean, Sarah. That's what happens. You go to the fucking jungle, there's going to be shit with bite marks on it there, too. It's the food chain. Uh, Sarah, I guess Sarah's not too fucking bright, though. But... Anyways, this shark tease continues on, and it's gotten old. So it goes to the shark, goes back to the people, back to the shark, back to the people. It's just a big tease. Like, they're building this up for way too long. Like, you need to build this up closer to when it's actually going to attack and not for such a long period of time. Make us think they're safe first before you start doing this. Like, pretty sure that's just, like, movie 101. You're not even giving us interesting shots of the shark. You're just... It's just nonsense and, like, POV shots. Oh, I'm getting mad again. It's been a, uh, it's been a, a couple movies ago, a couple episodes ago, I was mad, too. This one's making me mad. Okay, we'll get through it, guys. We'll get through it. I don't quite understand the dynamic between these three because sometimes it feels like they all hate each other and, like, the next second they all want to fuck or something. I don't really know. They haven't really given us a whole lot to work with. I guess we'll have to wait and learn more about this throughout the movie because that's, you know, what I want to know about during shark season is, you know, what they plan on doing with all of each other. Fuck's sakes. I mean, I assume they both want, like, just Jason's big dick. I, I think that's all ultimately what it comes down to, and they're going to get catty about it at some point. Like, but they're, they're grown-ass women, but they're acting like they're fucking high schoolers. I, I don't understand... Just, they're so poorly written. It's just really poor writing. Like, I don't know who these characters are supposed to be, who they're for. I, your guess is as good as mine. So they finally reach this rock formation, and yeah, it's some rocks sticking out of the water. Kind of like the shallows, you know, where Blake Lively is, like, hanging out on some rocks, but, like, a bit bigger. Nothing exciting. But Jason says, like, they're not there for exciting. They're there for unique, so it's fine. Whatever, man. You do you. As we zoom out of the rock formation, it sort of looks like it's man-made. Like, it 100% looks like it's man-made. Like, it was a part of a structure or something. So I don't know what it's supposed to be because I feel like we never address this again. So I have no fucking idea. So I don't know what the point of that was. I'm not entirely sure. Unless this is based on some other true story, um, I, I should have looked that up. Maybe, I'll, maybe I will before the end of the episode, but I just don't understand what this is supposed to allude to. It makes no sense. They start doing their photo shoot thing, and Megan looks jealous as Jason takes Sarah's pictures, and Megan says she feels weird being there, and long story short, Jason and Sarah used to bone. They don't anymore. 
and now he's into Megan. End of story. That's that's basically fucking it. I'm not gonna go into all the fine details of it because uh, I I kind of tuned in and out of this movie a lot because there was just parts of it where I'm just like I don't fucking care. Oh my god. Anyways, Megan starts looking at the photos on the camera as Jason and Sarah talk about Megan being a good match for Jason. Blah blah blah. CW soap opera and fucking nonsense. And then Jason and Sarah frolic in the water, and he's filming her with a fucking GoPro. And then Megan spots the shark headed for Jason and Sarah and yells shark at them, but they can't hear her. And we're supposed to believe as they're swimming back, whether they do finally hear her and see the shark, that Jason is pulled under. Because we see the shark like go like this, like bite, and then he dives down, but like as he's swimming towards us, we see him dive down because like he he does the actions of diving down and his feet go up in the air and kick down. So like they didn't even do anything to make it look like he was being pulled underwater. So again, a lot of this shit is just really jarring because it's not well done at all. I think I'm also being super critical of this movie because like it looks really nice. The cinematography is actually kind of gorgeous, but then they put these shots of the CG sharks and it just looks so awkward. And it's an, I don't even know if it's because the CGI is bad, but like they did something else to the footage and it just looks bad. I don't understand it. And then going to like this random stock footage that doesn't even quite match the cinematography of the other footage, which I know we get a lot of, but when it looks this nice, it's even more jarring to me. I, I don't know. It's almost like they should have filmed on a worse camera, so it would have looked a little bit better. I don't know. It, it's, not, it's fucked. We see some blood start to fill the water, and the girl starts screaming, so no one gets Jason now. Fucking problem solved. Huh? Right? Yeah. Sarah grabs her phone, but she has no sing signal, naturally, and her battery is almost dead, naturally, and her and Megan argue over who to call. So Sarah wants to call her dad, because earlier we learned that her dad is in, like, some volunteer search and rescue that's a part of the Air Force or something like that. Again, I was kind of tuning in and out, and it was just such a convoluted thing. It's because they were like, oh, your dad's in, like, the Air Force. And she's like, oh, he's not in the Air Force. He's actually this volunteer thing. And, like, it, it doesn't fucking matter. Just to say he's, like, Coast Guard or something, that would be fine. But anyways, yeah, that, that's what we have fucking have to work with here. So, yeah, she wants to call her dad because, obviously, he's an expert in, like, search and rescue and this sort of thing. But Megan's like, no, 911 is the people you call. Yeah. Sarah suddenly gets a signal after all this arguing. And James picks up. And Sarah tells him Jason is dead, and all, it basically almost tells them exactly where they are, although this doesn't seem to matter later on, I guess. I don't know. Fucking asylum, man. So he tells her to wait there as long as they can, and then her phone dies. James calls the Coast Guard or something, and they get a general idea of where the girls are, but they still need to do a search. So they got, like, one... They did, like, this whole two-minute fucking conversation about, like, well, we pinged the cell phone here. Now, if we were able to ping the cell phone with three towers, then we could have triangulated it. But because we only had one tower and there was this other... If they go on for two fucking minutes about this, or what felt like two minutes, and I just, like, what I just explained in that one sentence summed it all up. That's all we needed. Oh, my God. Just filler. Fucking filler. I hate nonsensical fucking filler. Jesus Christ. And I now know Michael Madsen is phoning in his performance. Like, quite literally, his whole role has just been on a telephone so far. He has not interacted with another person. He might even just be filming this in his own house. This came out in 2020. Maybe they did this during the pandemic, and, like, they just brought a camera over to his house. And, like, ah, here, read off this. Because sometimes it does feel like he's reading off a fucking cue card. God damn. He leaves Sarah a voice message on her phone, even though her phone is dead. <laughs> Whatever. Somehow the kayaks become undone, so both Megan and Sarah jump into the water to retrieve them. And since they'll be under... Right, the island's going to be underwater in less than a minute. So they just get into the kayaks, and then they start paddling for this other island they saw on their way there. 
The stock-footed shark heads towards them, and then the CGI shark takes its place as it circles them, and they paddle for the island, as I said, that they saw on the way there. But it sounds like it's a different island, because they talked about an island, they're like, oh yeah, this is like our usual spot. But then when Sarah was on the phone, she's like, oh, I saw this other island on our way here. I don't know where it is, but I know how to get there. I, who is writing this shit? And who's like reading this and being like, yep, that seems pretty good to me. Good God. As they continue paddling, they see a shit ton of fins in the water, so they turn back for the other island, but luckily some dolphins come in and bash into the sharks in a god-awful underwater CG fight. So bad. The girls continue to paddle, but Meg is tired. Meg? <laughs> I see what you did there, movie. Ha, <laughs> good job. So they stop for a while and talk about Jason and other shit before finally continuing on. They see more sharks swimming around them, which Sarah thinks is dolphins at first, and then she's like, oh no, that's a shark. They go back and forth. I'm thinking all of those fins we see in the movie poster are actually supposed to be dolphin fins, because I don't really think we see a bunch more sharks after this. Now that I'm thinking about it, this is complete fucking nonsense. Especially according to the plot description. Like, none of the plot description is pretty much in this movie so far. At least not in the way that they describe it. It's so fucking weird. So, they frantically paddle, and Meg finally suggests staying still, because sharks are attracted to vibration. So, Megan has some brains, and then Sarah finally shows that she has some brains, and they tie their kayaks together, a la, like, Jaws too. So, I guess we can sort of consider that maybe a Jaws reference? I'll take it. The shark swims around them, but seems to ignore them, and the shark swims away, but then something vibrates on Sarah's kayak. I don't know if this was supposed to be her phone, because I thought her phone was dead, unless she just got disconnected. Again, very unclear. Nothing in this movie is clear to me whatsoever. It, I feel like this movie's not finished. I feel like they didn't quite finish this movie, or they were filming like two different movies, and they're just like, uh, here's something. Oh my god, I have no idea. So yeah, the shark was ignoring them, but then, like, her fucking, I don't know, vibrator starts going off or some shit. Like, didn't mommy ever tell you not to leave your vibrators turned on? Sweet Jesus. And so the shark starts coming back and bites the kayak, but then lets go as the girls stay quiet. And Sarah points out its eyes rolled back, like when it bites into something when it can't see. I don't know why we needed this information right now. Maybe it's important later. Uh, that's what I wrote down. Uh, spoiler alert, it's not. It's really not. Oh, maybe it sort of is, actually, but not. Uh, if it is, it's kind of stupid. Anyways, um, also, when the kayak uh, got bit by the shark, 99% of it was CG. But there also seems to be some practical shark they're using. It's probably the one that shows up in all of the Asylum movies when they do use a practical shark. I feel like it's always kind of the same, like, one or two that they have. So, I mean, yay for one second of practical shark. Good for you. That'll earn you a half star on Letterbox Soap Bar. Let's see if you can earn some more. A man on a jet ski drives by and asks if they need help, and they try to tell him to turn the engine off, but he can't hear them. And the shark breaches the water, knocks him in, and chomps down on him, and the water is just filled with blood. Sarah wants to go get the jet ski, but Megan points out that when the guy fell into the water, the lanyard was attached to him. So I don't know if you know about jet skis, but it's kind of like, you know, on a treadmill where you have that, like, lanyard attached, so if you fall off, the treadmill turns off. Same thing with, like, the jet ski or a sea -Doo. So if you fall off, it stops operating sort of deal. And so it's like keeping the key around your wrist, basically. So yeah, when that guy died, uh, I guess the shark uh, has the key now. They could wait for the shark to poop out the key. That is an option that they did not consider. Oh, talk about missed opportunities. They detach their kayaks from each other and start paddling away, and Sarah spots a sandbar, so they paddle on to get some distance between them and the shark, and Sarah screams at the shark, like, what do you want? He just, he wants to eat you. He's hungry. I don't think there's much else to this movie. Like, I don't think there's any, like, 
broader message of like global warming or pollution, which is what I thought maybe they were going to allude to when they showed this man-like structure that they were taking photos on, but they were calling a rock formation. Like, I don't know. I just, I really don't fucking know. Back with phone dad, he leaves another message on Sarah's dead phone, or I guess maybe it's not dead. I don't really know at this point. With the worst line reading ever. Sarah, this is me. Checking in on you. Hanging tight. Like, just awful. Like, he he's reading out loud as if he's writing a Christmas card. That's what it kind of sounded like. It was so bad. And all the info he gives us is either pointless or we already know it. And then he calls her again, leaves another message, and lets her know the helicopter is in the air, and he explains some shit about the tides, and it, it's like full moon tides or king tides, so the island they're heading for may be underwater because of this tide that's coming in. Madsen, again, literally phoning in his fucking lines here. God damn it. And like, he's got nothing to work with. It's just him on the phone the whole time. N never interacts with anybody else. And then in the last part of this message, he gives the line, I know you've been through hell, but now it's time to go through high water. That's a terrible Michael Madsen impression, but that's the fucking line he gives. Like, yeah, noise. Back at the sandbar, Megan says she's sorry to Sarah because she knows Jason still loved her and blah, blah, blah. Drama, crying, yelling, stages of grieving, fucking etc. Um, I will say, I think the woman playing Megan should have been the lead because she's pretty decent compared to this, like, blonde Walmart Catherine Newton who's supposed to be leading us here. Sarah gives some speech, uh, but it's like she's out of breath the whole time. And, and, like, I get it, they've been paddling, but, like, she's been quiet, not saying anything, and they've been there for a while. Like, it's like, did they do, like, 25 takes, and they used this one where she was just, like, done with everything? And, like, yep, that that's the one that'll do. She sounds like she's bored and done with this movie. Well, so are the rest of us. Then we learn Sarah's mom died of cancer. And that's when her and Jason split, and she wants Megan to know that she loved Jason, but she wasn't in love with Jason. Who fucking cares? They babble on for a bit while. Um, I looked on Instagram while they were doing this, because I just, I did not fucking care about this conversation at all. It wasn't leading the plot anywhere. It wasn't making me care about these characters at all, especially not Sarah. I just, I thought she was awful. I'm sorry to whoever this actor is. It, the writing was bad, too, so that could be it. It may not entirely be her fault, but god damn. After that, they finally spot a helicopter, and they start waving it down, but it doesn't see them, so they start waving the kayaks. And then this part fucking infuriates me. Megan tells Sarah to grab her phone because she put a solar charger in there earlier. Fucking what? So this whole time, you could have been charging the phone because you have the solar charger and you've just been sitting there fucking dilly-dallying? Like, are you shitting me? You could have phoned so that, like, the rescuers could have triangulated your position because you don't, you paddled out. You could have gotten signal. Oh my god. So fucking stupid. And when Sarah checks her phone, she says she has full bars, but she can't get the charger to work. How do you know you have full bars if your fucking phone is dead? <laughs> I got nothing. I have absolutely fucking nothing for that. Uh, so, so again, like maybe the phone didn't die, but I'm pretty sure it would have fucking died by now. There's no way. Ugh. Frustrating. Frustrating. Megan grabs the charger from Sarah, and she gets it working after a long fucking struggle. And then they notice the tide is coming in faster than expected. Like, d damn full moon king tide, whatever the fuck it is. Megan starts flipping out as Sarah looks completely disinterested in being in this movie. And she calls her dad and gives him some information on where they are. And he tells her to leave her phone on to get a better idea 
uh, of where they are and that the king tides coming in could overwhelm the islands again more information we already fucking heard about like they, this could have waited until now we didn't need this on the phone message like that filler fucking filler god damn so if that if the tides come in and it overwhelms the islands they won't be able to send out the search and rescue helicopter so they'll have to like pause the search so Sarah's like, you know, if they, that happens, you know, I love you, blah, 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 because they might not see each other ever again because they'll be dead. <laughs> um, yeah. James calls someone so they can get a better idea of where the girls are because they lose connection with Sarah. James gets a call, and in short, we learn some whales were stranded, and then they died in some shallow water because some tides shifted, whatever. This sort of stuff happens, I, I guess. So we'll, I'll go with it for now. And that's why the shark was attracted to that area. And because it was so far off uh, the coastline or something, they usually just leave that and let nature take care of it. But then once they spotted the shark coming in, they removed all of the whale carcasses. And so now they just left... With like they're just left with a hungry shark with a big appetite. They were hoping the shark would go away once the food went away, but instead he just stuck around. They do like this whole fucking. If you thought that was a long fucking boring speech about it, um, imagine the one in this movie. It's even longer and even more boring. Or <laughs> it's fucking nonsense. But basically, the shark is hungry because the whale carcass is gone. That's the gist. So James and his Coast Guard dude say they need to search a new area and there's no time to waste because there could be a rogue shark out there. Ugh. It's so painful. It's so painful, this movie. As the, girl, as the girls paddle, the shark follows and they see the helicopter and Sarah gets its attention by using her knife to reflect the sun into the eyes of the helicopter pilot. I, I don't know if the knife was that shiny, but I'll, again, I'll let it slide because it, at least it's, well, it's one of the most realistic things to happen in this movie so far. The pilot sees the girls. He stops to take a picture. Like he says, oh, I better stop and take a photo. Takes out his phone, takes a photo, and then says like, all right, I'm almost out of fuel. I can't land here. Uh, I'm going to go back to base. Oh, okay. That's fucking cool. Why do these search and rescue helicopters not have like harnesses that they can send down to people isn't that what like why did it need to land was this helicopter actually expecting to land on an island because i don't even think this was like a water oh my god this is so stupid this is so dumb oh fuck so coast guard dude or not coast guard whatever james's buddy that he's been talking to on the phone this whole fucking movie say they're sending a boat to get the girls because the helicopter can't reach them and can't land and he just gives a whole list of reasons why he can't land. Don't care. The shark starts attacking the girls' boats, and Sarah stabs away at the shark and gets it a few times. The Coast Guard boat shows up, and they need the girls to paddle to them because they're still near a sandbar, so it's too shallow for them to get the boat in. Even though this giant shark is, seems to be swimming in there just fucking fine. Whatever. Doesn't matter. The girls head for the Coast Guard's boat. They're paddling away. The shark knocks Megan off of her kayak, but Sarah manages to pull her onto hers, so she's perfectly fine. The shark then hits the kayak that they're both on, sends them both flying into the water, so they start swimming for the boat. Sarah grabs an oar for protection. The shark jumps to attack her, and after a few tries, she stabs it in the eye, and the shark dies. Like, it was that fucking easy. So I, this is where I'm, I'm guessing, like, the eye stuff comes into play. Maybe... I don't know, and frankly, at this point, I really don't fucking care. Sarah and Megan both make it back to the boat, and Sarah's dad is on the phone, and he tells her he's flying out to see her, and the paramedics will be waiting for her on land, blah, blah, blah. And then she says when she gets back, she wants to talk to talk about Mom's studio, and that maybe she could pick up the brush again. Oh, yay, I forgot about the fucking painting. Thank God that side plot has been resolved. Sarah's taking up painting again. Oh, yay. After they're done talking, Megan says if she ever asks her to do her makeup again, she has to say no. <laughs> oh, my God. So funny movie. So funny. Megan then says Sarah should move to New Mexico because there's no water. It's all dry. <laughs> movie? Two in a row? <laughs> you better calm your shark tits down. 
Uh, but that's basically it. Yeah, no, that's pretty much it. They they just talk a bunch for like the last like five minutes of this movie or three minutes and then like a bunch of minutes of credits and that like that was pretty much it. It was just nonsense and it just ends. In case you couldn't figure out, um, this was terrible. <laughs> this was so the plot description alone is misleading as fuck. I, you know what? Just for an experiment, let's look up the plot description on IMDb. I'm gonna look it up right now and read it to see if it actually explains it a little bit better because this letterboxed one is fucked. I'm going to go back up to it for a second here in my notes. Uh, dozens of great white sharks. Okay, there, were, were, there weren't there were dozens. Like, I'm pretty sure all the fins we saw turned out to be dolphins. Uh, sleepy coastal town of Gold Coast, California. Pretty sure this took place in Florida, according to the movie. Uh forcing the town council to bring in a group of marine biologists. None of that happened in this movie. There's no town council, wasn't any marine biologists, shark hunters. There was none of that shit. Oh, but when one shark in particular refuses to go down without a fight, it will take all the biologists and hunters know-how to defeat the creature for good. None of that happens. I, I honestly think this is the wrong fucking plot description. So I'm going to look it up on IMDb right now. This is thrilling content. I know you love it. Oh, okay. So the IMDb plot description is uh, three kayakers fight for their lives when a great white shark traps them on a small sinking island. Basically, yeah. That, that's, uh, yeah. I, I got to start maybe not using Letterbox for plot descriptions because that is way the fuck off. Unless all this shit happened off screen or is like in a fucking novelization, I have no idea what the hell they're talking about. Good God. Yeah, as I pretty much predicted, it was one shark. Wasn't a lot of sharks. We maybe saw a lot of sharks. I'm still confused on that whole point. But this mishmash of bad CGI, gorgeous cinematography, and then this, like, standard-ass stock footage was just jarring. And it was just... I It was hard to focus on it, and it really took me out of the movie at uh, times. The The acting from the lead... And Michael Madsen was just not great. It just did not do it for me. It was it was hard to get through some of their scenes, if I'm being perfectly honest. I thought at least Michael Madsen would have saved this for me in some way. I was <laughs> dead fucking wrong. I'm like, okay, Free Willy, yeah, I watched that a lot when I was a kid. One of my favorite movies as a child. Uh, Reservoir Dogs, now one of my all-time favorite movies. Fuck yeah. Um, oh, he's also in Kill Bill. It was great. But yeah, no, he... God damn it. I mean, granted, they probably didn't pay him much, and he's not in it a lot. I feel like they're like, hey, can we use you for, like, half a day so we can throw your name on the fucking poster, and that way people will watch this garbage? Yeah, sure. Yeah, what the fuck not? Ugh. Yeah. How this has a 2.3 on Letterboxd is beyond me. Like, that's way too high. I'm I'm giving this half a star. Because I cannot see myself ever putting this back on for my own enjoyment. Or for any other reason. Like, there's just no way. Um, maybe next week will be better. We can only hope. But for now, that was Shark Season from 2020. As always, you can follow me on all social media, at Bucket of Chum Podcast. If you're watching this on YouTube, if you could leave a like, a comment, maybe subscribe, I'd really appreciate it. And if you really want to support the podcast, head over to patreon.com forward slash bucket of chum. And I will see you guys next time for an all-new episode of Bucket of Chum. Bye.